yeah, I, I met Frank or Lonnie at the time. Um, Lonnie, excuse me, right? Yes, yeah, at, at the time he was he was under Lonnie. Yeah, Lonnie Bro, I met Lonnie Bro, Lonnie Bro. Um, early on, and um, I always tell people he's the one that made me hang up my pen and and stop writing songs. I was wow, like, well, <laughs> I'll never write a song yeah. as good as this kid. He was my first signing. I was like, you know, I said, hey, you know, I called the guy who was running the company at the time, and I said, there's this kid that I came across. His music is phenomenal, and um, I, I have to do this deal. And he was my first signing. So at the time, I remember he it's so funny. He asked me for one hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars. I was like, that's the most random number. Those are the moments that you live for in this game. What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Third edition is out everywhere now on audiobook, ebook, hardcover, however you like to consume books, you can find the book. Today, my guest is Tab and Karyanya. He's the SVP of AR at BMG on the publishing side. So a lot of our conversation today is about publishing. Now, Tab started as a writer, and he's had number one hits with Justin Bieber and Madonna, Mary J. Blige, Britney Spears as a writer, and he's worked with everyone from Max Martin and Babyface and uh, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis. Um, so he, on the creative side, he has kind of done it all as a, as a songwriter, and he has now evolved into a music executive. Uh, he worked at Island J Def Jam on the uh, record side, where he signed Frank Ocean, and he signed Alessia Cara, and kind of helped develop those artists. So we talked about that a little bit. Um, and now we uh, spend most of our time today talking about how publishing works right now in this new music business. What are publishing deals look like? Um, what are the advances that a, that a songwriter can see if they get signed to a publishing deal? The difference between publishing deals uh, that they sign with artists uh, and publishing deals with songwriters that are selling their songs to get cut by artists. How that works. What do the terms look like? What are the advances? All of that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in how the publishing industry is working right now, uh, this is definitely the episode for you. Now, to clarify, you know, BMG has gone through a lot of iterations. B BMG is is technically an independent music company right, so, right now. They have a, a label side working on the masters. They have a publishing side. Um, but they're not a subsidiary. They're not under or part of the major label system anymore. Uh, they've gone over through the years. You know, maybe you, you remember, think of Sony BMG. They're not connected to Sony anymore. They're not connected to any major anymore. They're completely, wholly independent. Uh, they kind of had a, a resurgence over the last 10 years or so. Um, as they've uh, broken away from all of that, so it's a it's a it's a really fascinating, interesting company that is uh, prioritizing and able to kind of do things a little bit differently right now. And Tab speaks to that in in his process of of working with artists and and finding artists. You can find Tab on on LinkedIn. Uh, you're gonna want to uh, figure out how to spell his last name. We're putting that in the show notes. Of course, uh, you can find him there. You can find BMG. Uh, you can check out their website and see their, their roster and, and what they're doing. You can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram and TikTok and X. You can find me at Ari Herstan on Instagram. Visit Ari'sTake.com. Get on the email list. That is where you're going to get the most up-to-date information on the new music business. We let you know when new episodes come out and just other musings on the industry. Ari'sTake.com. Get on the email list. But right now, if just... Pause the episode and hit subscribe, hit follow. If you haven't, if you're not following the show, if you want the episodes to show up in your feed, if you want us to make more, hit the subscribe, hit the follow button, hit the thumbs up if you're listening and watching on YouTube. And um, give us a five-star review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you dig it. All right, let's kick into the show. Tab and Carrie Anye, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Totally. Um... So this is, uh, you know, whenever I get somebody on who's kind of a music executive um, like yourself and you've kind of worked on all sides of the industry, but, uh, you know, starting as a songwriter, starting kind of on the, the creative side, um, yeah. it's this interesting position and I, I appreciate kind of that there are people in your position that kind of 
have come from that side. You have that artist empathy as part of um, who you are. I'm, I'm curious, you know, taking where you've been from and where you are now, um, I'd just love to hear a little bit of the journey from, sure. you know, as a creative, as a songwriter to now the executive and kind of what you're bringing to this current role. And then we're going to dive into like what you're doing currently now with BMG and, and all of that. Yeah. Uh, so I'll take you back. I uh, grew up in the Bay, um, proud Bay Area kid, San Francisco is home. Uh, started out, my brother was a radio DJ at UC Santa Cruz. And so mm -hmm. I would always just go up there and hang out with him. And he would, he had like a midnight show or whatever. You know, I would always see if I could, you know, kind of put some records in the playlist for him and, you know, but you know, whatever, he didn't take much of my advice, but nonetheless, the music, I've always been drawn to music. Um, okay. And uh, along the way, you know, I, life is very ser serendipitous and, you know, you know, I had some key people in my life that were very key to my journey. Um, I'll, then I'll fast forward to my uncle was a very famous jazz singer. His name was Al Jarreau. Um, oh, wow. So, cool. Yeah, of course. So Al was my, uh, is, is my uh, uncle. And um, cool. he came to the Bay Area to sing at a 49ers game. You know, and he was like, what are you doing with your life? And I said, well, you know, I want to be in the record business, but my mom's going to make me go to college. So I got to go to college. And he's like, all right, well, why don't you just come down and spend the summer and hang out with me, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Sh that's amazing. So he invited me to go down to his house. Um you know, growing up in the Bay in a small single parent household, I had never seen a house like that. And I was like, oh shit, this is like my little version of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I'm like, I get to live with this guy. <laughs> amazing, beautiful home and uh, spend the summer there. And I literally was took the, took the Greyhound down from the Bay down to LA and I kind of stayed with him. And, you know, I just literally told myself, I'm not going home. You know, that, that's what I said. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna figure this thing out. I'm not, I, I gotta tell my mom how I'm not going to college. And so, um, literally one thing happened for the other. So I started, uh, I went to a digital underground concert. I'm dating myself and, uh, <laughs> Tupac was performing and uh -huh. I, I walked up to Pac and I said, listen, man, I, I said, do you have any advice? I'm from the Bay. Like I'm trying to figure this music thing out. And he was real cool. He was backstage. I had some access to get back there. And he said to me, he's like, no, just just keep hustling, you know, blah, blah, blah. Things will happen, blah, blah, blah. And while I was sitting there talking to Tupac, this kid comes up to me, attached me on the shoulder. He's like, wow, do you know Tupac? And I'm like, no, I don't know him. I just met him like, like 15 minutes ago. I just wanted to walk up to him. He's like, oh, okay, cool. What do you do? Blah, blah, blah. I said, I'm in the record business. I'm singing, songwriting, trying to figure out my journey. And uh, he said, oh, me too. And I was like, okay, cool. What do you do? He's like, I sing. And I'm like, all right, cool. Let's, let's get it together next week and figure this out. So... I call this kid up, I, I, he gives me his number, and I, I call him the next week. Oh, he calls me the next week, and he said, hey, what are you doing? Why don't you come by my house? And I was like, all right, cool. I'm not doing nothing. So I went by his house, and I drove up to this kid's house, and I was like, okay, shit, what does this kid do? This kid's house was was, a, was two acres, a block, whatever. And I was like, okay, wait, hold on. What do you do? He said, oh, my dad's on a TV show called Growing Pains. <laughs> and and I was <laughs> like, and literally, as he was telling me that, his dad's walking down the stairs. I was like, oh, shit, that's Jason Seaver. So... Long story short, <laughs> uh, me and Robin Thicke formed a, a group together and we started yeah. writing songs and trying to figure out our life. And between chasing girls and throwing parties, we were trying to be serious about our music <laughs> career. And um, so he went on to get a record deal with Interscope first and mm -hmm. kind of went on to go do his thing. And uh, I found a young artist named Sam Salter. Um, and what I wanted to do, he and I started writing songs and just trying to figure out our journey in this. Um, so we ended up writing songs. L.A. Reid ended up hearing the demos um, from Sam. And living in L.A., um, we did a deal. And part of the deal was when you, at LaFace at the time, was you had to move to Atlanta. And oh, so wow. I did a publishing deal, and we got Sam a record deal. And, you know, we had to move to Atlanta. And I'd never left the, you know, California pretty much, definitely never been to the South. And I remember we, uh, me and a friend of mine, my partner, at the time, Tricky Stewart, mega producer, mm. Tricky, who's done everything from, mm -hmm. you know, Rihanna to Beyonce and everything in between. He and I packed up because Tr Sam got signed to Tricky through Tricky's uh, JV in the face. And mm -hmm. we drove across the country and um, Tricky had already built a studio there. So he kind of helped me move and where I was moving. And I was I, one of the funny stories is I was moving to Atlanta. My shift was, I think, Mississippi into Georgia as I was driving. 
And I'll never forget this bumper sticker that said, uh, if I knew it was going to turn out like this, I would have picked my own damn cotton. <laughs> and oh I, was like, I was like, yo, I'm going back to California. Like, what, 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 what the hell, where the <laughs> oh, hell geez. am I at? Like, I do not belong oh, no. in the fucking South. Like, this is not for me. And, yeah. uh, and so that was my introduction to the South as I was driving into Atlanta, um, which turned out to be a culture shock, but the best thing that ever happened to me, honestly. Um mm. So what year Atlanta. are we talking now that you're moving down there? Uh, uh, this was 2001-ish. Okay. And so um, moved over there and we moved and uh, had a little apartment and just started writing songs. And Tricky and I were, mm. Tricky is, you know, we were literally figuring out how to get songs on artists. That was our goal, right? So and moved through these terrible um, structured publishing deals that we had at the time. So yeah. um I ended up finding I, what I figured out as a writer is because these deals, these MDRCs, which was minimum delivery requirement. So I had mm. to figure out how to get through these publishing deals, and it's hard pitching songs to get through those get through those deals. And so what I figured out was I said, okay, cool. You know, what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go find an artist, and I'm gonna go sign artists, and I'm gonna get through these deals this way. Um, so I'll put them, all my songs on a particular artist. So I was like, all right, this is what we're gonna do. So I ended up finding an art. Uh, Initially, I found a rapper. Her name was Soleil, and um, she got her signed to DreamWorks. And we ended up mm-hmm. having a number one rap record out of a song called uh, "Who That." It was number one for eight weeks with JT Money, and um, so that was my first number one record. Um, mm-hmm. And then I went on to find another artist. Um, her name was Blue Cantrell. She had a song called "Hit 'Em Up Style," and uh, mm-hmm. another number one, another pop record, another number one. And um, Dallas Austin wrote that smash for us but what i learned along the way was like okay i'll you know i'll put these songs on these artists and i'll get through these publishing commitments and i'll be able to get some more checks and more money in advance there so that was my songwriting thing go ahead wait so i would i just want to ask you a little just to just to understand the mdrc portion of this this publishing sure. deal and how this works and and just to understand sure. a little bit of the history and maybe get into current publishing deals but um what was the requirement in with your publishing deal in the minimum delivery? Like, sure. did you just have to turn in songs or you have to get songs cut? And that's why you had to uh, find these artists to sign Great and actually question. cut your songs. Great question. So it was, uh, it was, I had, I think at that time I had a minimum, my MDRC was four wholly owned songs, which means I needed four 100% records, right? So however... I, and I was writing for the most part 25, 45, 35. So you, I'd need four releases of 25 to get one whole song. So I gotcha. Okay. So that that's how the deals were structured back then. So what mm. I was doing then, and so I was, that's why I needed to have a, a body of work or, or take, get a, a big chunk of, a, of an album at the time. And so mm. I was doing that. And so that's how those deals were structured back then. Obviously, Deals have been modernized, um, thank God, and a lot yeah. of times now they're re- they're recoupment based, you know, which is which is a lot more fair. If, so if you make the money, we'll move you to the next yeah. option. Or if, in my case, now that I'm a publisher, I um, if the writer's within you know a couple, you know, anywhere from 150 to whatever into the deal, and they're active and they're moving, I'll always move them to the next their next option. Um, mm. I'm very empathetic when it comes to songwriters and artists in, in, in that sense. I mean, so the uh, I, I'm curious kind of how publishing did, and I know we're we're jumping ahead and we're gonna jump around and I'm gonna get there to it. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna jump back to, to Frank Ocean and Alexia Takara, don't worry. But um, I, I wanna I wanna like because we are on the new music business podcast, I think you know, a lot of people are really curious and interested and since we're on this point now, I just wanna jump into um, you know, current publishing deals right now, especially like, because at BMG, you're on the publishing side, right? Yes, I am. Yep. How are publishing deals structured right now, um, maybe as they, uh, and, and how are they different now than what you've seen in the past? Um, now the deals are, it's funny because we've, we've moved from MDRCs um, in, mm-hmm. in modernizing deals. Then we had a moment where the deals were recruitment based. Um, um, co-pub deals. So, co-pub Explain structure. what that means and how that works. So, co- co-pub deal is where we share the copyright in a sense. So, it's like um, with with the publisher as well as the writer. So, we share the copyright. Um, 75, 25 is usually the structure of the deals. 
until recruitment and then what it is. Now the majority- And is that ownership or is that just dealing with uh, how the royalties break down? It's it's ownership, it's ownership of your your share. It's ownership. Um, Okay. And then, and eventually they can, depending on how the deal is structured and how you work it out in the deal, then it can revert back to you over a period of time at a certain point in the deal, usually 10 years, seven to 10, sometimes 15, 12 years, whatever. You get your portion back. Um, Now the deals are, it's a lot more deals that we're doing now in, in publishing our admin deals. So um, sometimes the, and the, the splits are, you know, they can vary depending on the level of the writer. Uh, I just did a deal with a very successful writer and, you know, he's, he's got an amazing split of 90-10, you know, in, so in his favor. 90 to so, the writer. 90 to the writer. 10%. So we're collecting, um, we're, so we're admitting his, his music pretty much. So, yeah. And to clarify, but, admin means you're at, you're not owning the not publishing, owning, we, the copyrights. Yeah, what, right? what we're doing is we're literally leasing the music for a period of time. Gotcha. And yeah. is that how BMG is structuring most of their pub? Is is BMG more, mostly admin these days and not doing these co pub ownership deals? Um, usually it it, it varies. I, I do. Okay. I'd say out of every ten deals, I'm doing. I'm doing six co-pubs, four admins, because a lot of times for me, I'm I'm signing new writers, so um, okay. I, I always I take the risk, and the risk has to be shared. <laughs> yes, so so talk to me when you're signing a new writer, um, and I'm assuming this is this is where we get into kind of the co-pub deal because you're investing. Um, talk to me some. What does a new uh, publishing deal look like these days with a new writer? Uh, give me kind of just a, sure. you know, a boilerplate example of what that what that could look like. Depends on what he's coming in the deal with. So if he's coming sure. in with a piece of a of a Drake record or a piece of a Cardi record or whatever, a Doja Cat record, um, usually, um, depending on let's just say he has twenty percent, twenty five percent of of the song. Um, and it, by the way, I'll have to add this caveat in it. Most of the times deals can be a little competitive. And so you, you have an attorney who's shopping it to Sony, Warner Chapel, um, Pulse and all the other indies as well. So, um, yeah, so depending on how competitive the deal is, and then it's at that point, it's sort of a beauty contest. You know, it's like, you know, how we can exploit your catalog, how we can help you grow, how we can put you in different rooms and how we can grow your business. At that point, we're really selling kind of what we can do to help bring to the table as a writer versus just you mm-hmm. writing songs and, you know, not receiving mm-hmm. any help and any services from your publishing company. So what mm-hmm. we like to do when, when we are in the process of negotiating, you know, creatively getting married, I like to make sure that, you know, we're trying to make sure that, like, hey, listen, you know, I, and I think one of the things going back to my songwriting days is like I can always... I, I let them know, listen, I've been where you are and I've grown my business. I can help you grow yours as well. Mm, nice. And so so how to like I, I want to give it even a little bit more specific just because there's some people listening who actually have no concept of what a publishing deal looks like. You know, I think there's been a lot of um, uh, there's a there's a lot of um, ink of, on kind of what record deals look like, but not so much yeah. as on publishing deals. And I don't think there's as um, it's as familiar. So um, it, give me an example, like uh, somebody you, you sign this deal, there's maybe an advance up front, there's a split, they are they have to write sp- songs i'm assuming there's a certain they do they have to turn in songs do they have to get songs cut like kind of break down just like the the you know the the tent pole deal points that are just like in most publishing deals that you work with these days um so yeah again so if the writer's coming in with with a cut a significant piece of a record um uh, yeah. at that point we start collecting on that record um okay the structure of it the deals are again the co-pub deal would be you know what we'll do is we'll advance you whatever uh, anywhere from two fifty to five hundred or whatever. Um, you know, mm-hmm. deals are pretty thousand dollars. Yeah, these, yeah, these days. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it's funny because I had a, I have a, a mentor to me, and he always tells me publishers, record companies have to be right three out of ten times in order for their business to keep going and be successful. Publishers have to be right seven out of ten times. Oh wow. <laughs> You know, okay. Us, because we're collecting <laughs> sure. a smaller piece of the pie. <laughs> yes. Um, so 
a lot of times, again, it's like we, as, as, as I sign, and I'm not, we don't sign to the degree of a Warner Chapel or Sony ATV. Um, we sign, or you, I'm sorry, Universal as well, but I get, again, we, I, I, we're, we're a big boutique, as I like to call it. And so I like to mm-hmm. make sure that if I'm signing 10 riders a year um, at that point, I'm making sure that this is a business that I can grow, that I can see a future in, that the riders work ethic is, is you know, they're not going to take the cash and, and run. I've seen an artist do that before. When I worked at Sony ATV, I signed somebody and he had a big Gaga hit and I never saw him again. <laughs> he took the check. He didn't turn in any more songs or anything? Didn't show no, up any it. sessions Deuces. or nothing? <laughs> Deuces. <laughs> oh, God. And he left. And I was like, oh, shit. So I, I, I've, I've seen that before. Um, okay. As well. But uh, it, again, it's, it's, it's a lot of those things where you're really making sure that there's a, there's a, a, a partnership, honestly. It's in, yep. and that's really what I like to focus on. It's, it's much more of a partnership and, and how we grow your business and, and, and help you, honestly, to become the best writer, producer, or artist you can be. And then are these deals, because with record deals, uh, they deal in um, uh, singles or, or albums, typically, uh, historically. Sure. How do publishing deals, what do they deal in? Uh, we're dealing in, when I'm, when, let me go back. If I'm signing an artist, I'm dealing in his song. So if he's, I have a rapper that I signed out of Atlantic, a kid named Simba, um, from Italy, who's signed to Atlantic out of the Bay Area, who's an amazing, amazing artist. I believe is next to go. So in the case yeah. of Simba, like he's writing his own project, he's um, developing mm. it, and he's actually here in Atlanta working now. Um, so Simba's coming to the studio, writing, you know, collabing with. The other day, he's in, he's like in today with Mike Will, and he's working with Mike Will and another writer I signed, a Pop Lord, and they're working on a project together. So it's like one of those things where, like, so collectively, Simba will turn in the song after he's finished, and he loves it, and Atlanta accepts it, and it is what it is. Maybe he'll control 30% of the record, 40% of the record, whatever the splits are. Um, we'll take that. We'll add it to his, you know, his account. Um, as the song comes out, as the song earns money, we'll try to put it in a video game. We'll try to put it in a movie. We'll try to sync it, you know, in a, in a scene or whatever we can to get it. Obviously, to help the song grow as well as to help the song earn as well and to exploit that particular mm-hmm. record. So, I mean, that's kind of the process early on. Gotcha. Um, you know, that makes sense. And so you're you're kind of uh, trying to do whatever you can um, to help that song earn, um, yeah. you know, with the tools on the publishing side. Um, how do the terms work uh, with these kinds of deals? Is it is it certain number of years? Is it a certain number of, of songs that are actually released, uh, you know, with an artist like Simba yeah. or, or anyone who's kind of working on their own career? Of course, they're going to be releasing. It's, yeah. dare I say, easier for them to get cuts because they cut their own songs. Right. Uh, whereas like other songwriters that might, you know, come in, uh, you know, like you early on, it's kind of like you, you might need other artists to cut your song. So I'm curious, you know, when you're signing maybe an artist uh, that writes his own songs versus maybe a songwriter that doesn't write or doesn't release uh, their own music, isn't necessarily an artist per se. Um, yeah. Are those deals structured differently? And, and what are the terms and how does the term work? Sure. Usually it's um, in a co-pub deal, it's options so it's it's three options four options um and there's always there's always a a, a buyout clause in the deal as well we, so if if i advance you half a million dollars you can buy yourself out at 115 percent of the advance um as okay. well or you know a lot of times or if a writer recoups um you know he can do that as well it's funny i i was just thinking about this you know kelly for this but i did sign mike karen um, that we, when I was at Sony ATV, and mm. Mike is obviously the genius and has grown to become an amazing executive slash entrepreneur in the business. But I signed Mike, yeah. and Mike became so successful initially. And the funny thing is, when I was leaving ATV, he bought himself out of his own publishing deal. So there, there's, there's that component as well. That sure. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. And and what do options mean when you say that we deal in options? What is an option? Um, so they're period. So it's, it's, uh, if, if I sign you November 3rd, it's your option period will sort of run concurrently to a calendar year in a sense that way. Okay. And depending on if you, and if you, if you financially move through your option, if you earn in the, in that period, 
you, I can move you or you get close to recruitment or, or recruit, I'll move you to the next option. Got it. And, and, and do these current co-pub deals, do they require um, the songwriter to turn in a certain number of songs or is it really just all about what you earn? And so you could turn in a hundred songs or three songs, but if you recoup that advance and you start earning and, and um, you know, you're profitable, then it doesn't really matter. I, I tell my writers to turn in everything because you never know how a okay. song can be exploited and used. Um, but basically, gotcha. really, the, the songs are about what comes out, what what streams, what 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 the label puts out, what's you know what's released. Yeah, and obviously, singles yeah. tend to make more money. <laughs> Right, right. Cool. Uh, cool. Well, I mean, yeah, super helpful. And uh, thank you for, for breaking down this publishing 101 for everybody listening. Because like, you know, I think there's a lot of conversations that deal in top level philosophy, which is really important. And we're going to do we're going to talk about that as well. And I'm really curious about, you know, your take on all of this, especially with your background. But I think what gets lost in what I a lot of people listening right now, because we have a lot of songwriters and artists listening right now, is the nuance there of just how this works. And so, you know, when you're looking at new songwriters to potentially sign to deals, what are you looking for? And specifically, let's talk about the Atlanta scene. Let's talk about hip hop. Let's talk about, you know, uh, the, you know, hip hop, R&B kind of in this, this realm that is, that functions very differently, maybe from, um, or, or tell me if it functions differently from pop, like LA pop or how LA works versus Nashville country versus Atlanta. And, and just like, what is your, you know, what is your philosophy around this and what are you looking for? Um, Atlanta does function differently, um, okay. which I love, and it's its own culture. Um, it's a little different from when I started, but you know, I always equate it to I call it Black Nashville, right? You know what I mean? Um, and <clears throat> Nashville, you know, people go to they 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 work from nine to five. They they go to the studio, they go write records, and, and they're home by dinner. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's a real <laughs> job, and which I love as well. Um, Sure. Our hours may be different, <laughs> but in the sense, yeah. <laughs> writers go to the studio every day. Um, you know, uh, Atlanta was, it's funny because it, I, I, I have a fond place for this, obviously, because creatively, this is where I got my start. And, you yeah. know, I think it's, it's a great place and I will, I will always uh, have a fond spot for it because it, it's, there's a community of songwriters here. There's studios everywhere. There's infrastructure, you know, I, that that supports it you know so in that sense that's what i love about the atlanta songwriting scene and and mm. and what it is and how it supports its writers on in the urban space and you know from the pros that are here bmi as cap um, Catherine is very prominent in, in what we do here um cool as well and and you know even sony tv just put up a satellite office here in atlanta so well, nice finally some there, there's some sort of a footprint here that people are sort of recognizing it's long overdue. Um, that being said, in terms of, um, I think your initial question was about how deals are done here. Is that what you were asking or? Well, I'm just curious about, uh, what you look for in someone that you're going uh, to sign and, and, sure. um, you know, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, if I'm signing an R, I sign a kid named Sofago. Um, he's a up and coming rapper who I think is amazing. Um, signed to mm -hmm. Travis Scott and works with a good friend of mine named Barry Hefner. Um, Sago's a kid who's 19 years old, 18 years old. He's, it's very DIY, right? He kind of built his, his own fan base, his own movement, TikTok, Instagram, um, and made his own records at home, um, built his own fan base, and now tours the world globally, right? And, um, and he did that from Kennesaw, Georgia. So it's like, it's literally sort of how it, that is what I tend to look for people who are very, you know, self-starters and, you know, you have to be in, in this day and age. Right. So, um, and then at the same time, it's still a business and understand how to market themselves and how to grow their business. And yeah, that, that, that's definitely one of the things I look for in a traditional songwriter. I look for your ability to kind of be able to, tell multiple stories in multiple genres if you can like you know if, mm. if 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 you're able to walk into a room um with summer walker and write tap into her i know she writes a lot but if you can co-write with her and 
to provide melodies and provide concepts, stories, lyrics, that's very important. Um, and if you're able to do that, and then on the flip side, go work with City Girls the next day, um, and 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 go write some ratchet hip hop shit because you you know that touches you know there's our strip club culture is there and our culture is here in, in many different facets here. So like I lo- I look for your ability to kind of be multifaceted as a song mm-hmm. songwriter. Mm-hmm. Nice. And how involved are you in the process these days? The creative process. The creative process, yeah. Uh, not that much unless they ask me. You know what I mean? Okay. You know, I, if 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 I'm asked, I'll I'll provide my two cents. But no, you know, I I I tell people, listen, you know, you're a big boy. You know, you, you took the check. You know what you're doing. Let's go. I, you know, <laughs> but for me, what I'd like to do is help. You know, listen, if you, I have a writer that's in town from from London, and he's in L.A. So you know, I I I set help set up sessions. I put him in rooms. I do that if he needs some help extending his travel. You know, look, I wear many hats. Sometimes I'm. I could be a yeah. therapist for some. I could be a travel agent for some. I, you know, I could. <laughs> I could be a manager for some. You know, it's it's whatever sure. the job calls for on that particular day. Nice. Um, I'm curious. Uh, you've been at BMG. How long have you been at BMG? Four four years now. Uh, three three and change. Three and change. Okay. Mid pandemic. Yeah, um, I oh, gotcha. Um, and how is this different? Because this BMG, I know it's gone through so many iterations over the years, yeah. and and it's uh, you know it used to be Sony BMG, and then it was a major, and now and then it broke off, and it bought and sold. I was trying to do all this like research yeah. on like where is BMG right now? Um, it's technically BMG as a as a company is completely independent, right? It's not mm-hmm. tied to a major label yeah. or major publisher. Is that right? Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah, and, BMG is a standalone, yeah, standalone Berlin-based company. Um, yeah, that has a big footprint here in the states, a huge footprint in Nashville, and a huge mm-hmm. footprint as well in in, in LA, um, as well as Latin America. Um, we also have a recorded music division, which is based out of Nashville as well. Okay, so you spent some time um, at Island Def Jam, uh, which is a, a major. Um, yeah. How and, and was that on the publishing side as well? Or was that on the the? No, uh, I, well, I was, that's I, a record label, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I was an A&R. So that's on the record. Mm-hmm. making records. Yeah. So uh, tell me about kind of uh, the difference in that role and then kind of the current role that you have and in difference in companies being a, a major label over here, Island Def Jam, uh, versus now working at an independent company on the publishing side. You're kind of sure. straddling both of those worlds. I, I, I always say as a, as, an, as a publisher, I'm a seller. <laughs> as an a and on the music side, I'm a buyer. <laughs> um, okay. So in, in that sense, you know, I'm always trying to sell songs to a and R's. Hey, you know, here's, I'm pitching songs sometimes, you know, and so mm. and for my writers, um, as an a and R, I was buying songs because if, if there was a record that I loved, I was going to buy it. So there's that, that's where I, you know, I guess the the two differentiate. But um, and mm. it, my role there was obviously it was just it was it you know I would work with an artist from. Anybody from Tony Braxton to Young Jeezy to Alessia Cara, um, mm-hmm. I would, you know, it's always it's it, depending on where the artist is in their journey, right? So, Tony, Tony, me working with Tony, she had been sold. She had a like diamond. It. She's that she's Icon. one of very few people who has a diamond plaque. You know, she sold ten million. Right, so, right. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, won Grammys and all that stuff. Um, it was really cool working with Tony because at at this stage of her career, at this stage of her career, when we were working together, it was. Uh, a scenario where you sit down with with somebody who's very accomplished, who's done it all, and mm-hmm. say, you know, where do you want to go, and how can I help at this particular point, you know, you know, and 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 her thing was, and and then at that point you sort of add your two cents once you build trust, and she and I built a really good relationship, and we had it. We ended up getting a very we we ended up getting three Grammy nominations out of the album we made, as well as a number wow. one record, which was uh, we had a number one AC record, which was number one for nine weeks, which was which I'm very proud Incredible. of. Yeah. So yeah. So in that, it's 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 taking a career that's already well accomplished and sort of taking it to the next level. Um, and and listen, and and we are doing it in a in a different time than when she was making records at her peak and sure. at her height. So um, you know, 
you would hear on Break My Heart on Kiss FM or on, on whatever, you know what I mean? Now, Tony, her music is now much more urban AC, but to me, mm -hmm. it's still impactful, still great songs um, as our as our business has shifted. So you're you're a co you're, you're having to take all that in, in, into you know, in, in, in while you're making the record, saying, hey, this is where we are, this is how things have adjusted, and, and sort of you know, because sometimes artists, you know, I, I I find that especially those that have had mega success like Tony, you know, it's it's like we're in a new model of the record business. The business has shifted. So sometimes part of my job is sort of explaining that. Not that they don't necessarily know it, but sometimes you have to translate yeah. from what the label is or what it was or how it used to be versus how it is now. Yeah. And that's always very tough. But yeah, you know, that, 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 well, that's... Well, that, I mean, you bring up a good point. I, I, let's talk about that a little bit because when you signed Frank Ocean, uh, yeah. let's talk in, what, 2009, I want to say? Was it... Around then, yeah, around, yeah, around then, maybe a little before then, a little before then. So, a little so, before then, yeah, yeah. I, I I met Frank or Lonnie at the time. Um, Lonnie, excuse me, right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> at the time he was he was under Lonnie. Yeah, Lonnie Bro, I met Lonnie Bro, Lonnie Bro. Um, early on, and um, I always tell people he's the one that made me hang up my pen and and stop writing songs. I was wow, like, oh, <laughs> I'll never write a song yeah. as good as this kid. <laughs> the, the moment sure. I heard the moment I heard his music, I was like, "Oh shit!" Like, uh, you know what? Let, let me go figure out this next part of my career, become an executive. Because <laughs> it, 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 Man, it, there's just all, some talents almost, that'll do that to you. Yeah, yeah. it's almost the moment. I, it, you know, I'm a big sports fan, so a lot of my analogies are, are sports related. But it's almost the moment when you're really playing with a kid, and you realize, you know what? I can't dunk anymore. And this kid, this, this kid's a lot faster than me. <laughs> so <laughs> sure. At that point, it was. I realized it was time for me to hang it up. Um, yeah, so I was consulting with Frank at the time. I'm, I'm sorry, I was consulting yep. at, at Bug Hitco. And okay. he was my first signing. I was like, you know, I said, hey, you know, I called the guy who was running the company at the time. And I said, there's this kid that I came across. His music is phenomenal. And um, mm -hmm. I, I, I have to do this deal. And he was my first signing. So at the time, I remember he, it's so funny, he asked me for $162,000. I was like, that's the most random number. Like, whatever. If that's, if that's what you want, let me go find it. Let me go get it. Um, and that being said, so I went to go get him that deal. And the first thing I thought in my mind was like, yeah, well, you know, as a new a and I was like, yo, I got to get this money back. Yeah, I gotta, how, how are we going to yeah. go make this $162,000 back? Right. So the first thing I did was I remember I took him to Atlantic Records. They fumbled that whole thing up, you know, by leaving us in the lobby for too long. <laughs> And if you know anything about Frank, Frank doesn't wait for nobody. And uh, so he was like, you know what? I'm out of here. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's go. Um, at the time. So then I remember I called Scooter Braun because I was helping Scooter put together Justin Bieber's project. And I said, Scooter, I said, listen, I, I got this song. I need you to cut this record. <laughs> You're going to love it. Justin's going to love it. So uh, Frank gave me a record. So we started off then and um, put, put my Frank first placement was on Justin Bieber, a song called Bigger. Um, so that was on, on, that was my first thing of like, okay, I'm going to get this kid's money back. So I placed that record there. Secondly, I said, okay, cool. I got to get this kid. My, my goal was to get him a record deal. I said, I have to get him a record deal. And, um, Tricky at the time was, um, working at Island Def Jam. And I said, Trick, I said, listen, man, I, I, I found this kid. He's, he's phenomenal. Like you gotta hear his music. And, um, again, I'm dating myself. I gave him this CD and I said, listen, Tricky was driving. Tricky was driving to Vegas at the time. I remember he said, I'm going to drive to Vegas. I'll listen to it on my drive to Vegas from LA. I was like, cool. I said, listen, a couple weeks ago, I'm buying Tricky and called me back. And I was like, he's, a, and then he's like, yo, I'm in the car. I'm actually listening to the CD that you, you brought me. He gave me and he's like, yo, well, who is this kid? And I was like, thank God. I'm like, listen, I said, sign him, Trick. You got to sign this kid. He's phenomenal. Blah, blah, blah. And, uh, Trick took my advice and uh, he signed him. But the funny part about that whole thing, I'll never forget. Uh, Frank called me and he says, he, you know, then he starts working on the mixtape, mix which was, we all know, the Style Ultra. And at the time, and he calls me, he's like, I'm working on a mixtape. And I was like, a mixtape? Like, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. I was like, why would you do that? I was like, you have a record deal. Go make an album. I was very, I, I can admit when I was wrong and I was very wrong at the time. And I'll, it, 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 I'll never forget, I remember I was coming back from the airport one time and I remember um, somebody handed me an LA Times and and this is when I knew that this, Frank had put out the, the mixtape 
And I remember opening up this, this, this LA Times and there he was. And there was this amazing review of, of this mixtape. I can't think of the, art, the, 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 the guy who wrote the article. Um, but I, 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 at that moment, I was like, oh my God, I think we have something here. I think, I think this, I'm going to get this $162,000 recoup. Back. <laughs> I'm going to make that money back, right? <laughs> yeah, I was like, thank God. And then um, literally it happened overnight, literally. Like, you know, um, at that point, and then the funny part about that, everybody was trying to find him. Everybody was like, all the labels were like, where is this kid? Where is this kid? Where is this kid? Including the fucking label he was signed to, did not know that he was signed there. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so they had no wow. idea. That, yeah. that that he was signed there. They were like, we, we need to find this. We need to find this kid. Come to find out, you know, they looked and they realized they had a contract with the kid, so he was already signed. So uh, you, you talk about being lucky and having it fall right in their lap, you know. So yeah, wow. he was he, he was. Signed I mean, also, like, yeah, what they were prioritizing at the time that they didn't even realize that there was one of their <laughs> exactly. artists. But, so, you know, we're in a very different industry now than we were at the time of when you know Lonnie is writing songs and you're you're bringing him on and and he turns into Frank Ocean um you know of the kind of the early mid 2000s to to where we are now where it's like you know when you when you heard him and you you found him it's kind of you said he, this talent was so undeniable that yeah. you put your pen down um yeah. you know what are you seeing like i guess how do you approach seeking out talent these days uh when you mentioned before like so you even talked about social media I, I, people have opined and and i think there's been books about this that if if frank ocean was coming up in this time in the time of social media we wouldn't have frank ocean uh someone has said the same as michael jackson some of the people have said the same as prince it's just like you know i'm curious your take on you know brilliant artists that are coming up these days that just they're 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 brilliant in studio but online it's just they're that's not where their interests lie listen i i beg to differ i i, I okay. believe i believe if there's a kid in gary indiana who turned out to be michael jackson we'd find him cream rises to the top i believe frank ocean and he, he's he works in any era he is he is an any era artist um if Frank doesn't get found, I blame the industry. I don't. I don't blame the artist. <laughs> oh, of if, course. If, but if that's where our industry's at right now. Yeah. If, is if, it not? If, if absolutely, if you're sitting in one of these buildings and you're waiting on research, and and you hear that music and that doesn't move you and say fuck research, I'm gonna go get with this kid, then that's on you. And 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 to me, that's that's sort of where we are in terms of what A and R, the state of current A and R is. Um, you know, and I, 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 I coined the phrase, uh, I don't believe in research, I believe in ear search. So, you know, I, I trust ear search over research any day of the week. Um, I, I got in this business because I'm a fan of music. Um, yes, data matters. Yes, research mm -hmm. matters. Um, and, you know, look at what Monty and Avery built, the behemoth, which is Republican. That is their, mm -hmm. that is sort of their foundation and they've done it better than anybody else can do it. Um, I'm I'm still a in that sense. I consider me call me a throwback, call me a dinosaur. And or when that comes, listen, I, I still trust. I I trust talent over it mm. all. I I appreciate hearing this, and this is the second conversation I've had in just a couple of weeks. Uh, we just had uh, Sherry Bryan and Omar Grant from from Rock Nation on That's the show, dad. and similarly, they're talking about how they develop artists and they will invest and spend years with artists. Uh, before seeing a return yeah. and this is something that i i hope and and it's giving you're giving me hope here tab and and <laughs> sherry and, and omar give me hope too that the pendulum is swinging back the other way because i feel like for the last 10 years the industry especially of course on the major side the major label side have been so obsessed with the research and they're 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 wearing earmuffs while they're just studying the data and yeah. it hasn't been and it's only been and we've seen that over the last you know four years or so where the majors would just try to buy up all of the TikTok hits and, and, you know, just doing single deals and just trying to like make their numbers work out and their timelines have gotten shorter and shorter. Sure. So, I mean, I guess, how do you balance that when you are now, like you said, you're a, a seller 
and you're needing to sell these songs to major labels to you know these art these labels that are with artists that are trying to make their books work out now are you finding that there is any kind of um uh, uh is, is there is that discussion happening and and is that something where um you're you're finding resistance because you have this you're doing your ear search and they're doing their research potentially at the label how do that how do how does that align um it doesn't <laughs> yeah no I, <laughs> uh i'll say you know listen it's great to hear that omar and sherry feel that way because yeah again they are it, it's so funny you said it because actually there's a record right now that i love that one of my writers did and his name's scribs riley from the uk um him and this girl named Lily Frank wrote what I believe was a smash. And I sent it to a couple a &Rs. And you know, the one person who called back and said, do not share this record. I'm keeping this record for such and such artist was Omar Grant. And this happened Amazing. last week. That's Omar, fantastic. <laughs> Omar was like, don't send this record out to anybody else. And again, that gave me hope that mm -hmm. there's, that there's still those a &Rs who, can hear a record and can react because our business mm -hmm. like those moments like when you get a smash in your inbox it is like that happens if you're lucky three times a year four times a year you hear good records but when you get a smash when you get one of those oh shit stop the presses those are the moments that you live for in this game mm. and and yes it doesn't mean that you're gonna it's gonna turn out to, to translate to be a billion streamer and all those things and move the needle. Sure. But at the end of the day, those are the moments that you say, okay, cool. Now let me go find the right artist for this song. Let me go do this and let me go make sure that everybody else feels the way. Let me galvanize the team and make sure that they love this record. We get this record from, you know, from zero to 60 to zero to 100. And it, it so in that sense, I don't find many a &Rs that are doing that, but yeah. Literally, that this just happened last week with with Omar and I, and um, yeah. <laughs> so thank God they still that's, have the game. <laughs> that's fantastic. I love to hear that, and and you know, I told them the same thing. It's just like I the when I start to have more conversations with people who are passionate about the art and the process, and um, you know, the development uh, that gives me some hope because it, there's been a lot of um, it's been challenging kind of seeing the industry for the last five or so, five, 10 years, just just chasing all of these like shiny objects everywhere and yeah. and kind of flailing. And like we saw that in the TikTok era and it was kind of like uh, that that doesn't have to do with the long term uh, development or even, you know, what what an artist could be. So. I'm curious, um, you know, moving forward uh, in your role now, um, what are you looking for? And for the songwriters who are who are uh, listening to this right now, maybe even talk to the ones in Atlanta, you know, the artists in Atlanta uh, who are hearing this and it's like, well, what should I do to get on Tab's radar? Like, I, I align with his philosophy. This is great. I think I'm great. How do I get my stuff to Tab? What, what's, what are the steps they should be taking? What, how should they be thinking about this? Um, for the singer songwriters that are out there that are doing it, you know, I, I, I literally firmly believe this. I believe that if you do good work, good work will find its way to people like me, to people like Ryan Press, to people like Walter Jones. We will find you, you know, mm. great, great a &Rs, great publishers. You know, we haven't been doing this this long without finding those right people. So. I, 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 you know, and, and maybe that's sort of a generic answer, but at the end of the day, literally go do great work. I, you know, I was a songwriter. So, you know, I, I'll tell you, like, I remember one time I literally begged my way on the Britney Spears' album. Um, you know, I, 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 I felt like I could deliver. I felt like I could write mm -hmm. the songs. I felt like given the opportunity, you know, and this was, I had a publisher at the time, but, you know, some, and I guess this is the writer that I've signed, but, Oh, they didn't even need to be signed. Sometimes, like I, I was my own advocate. I, you know, and and I think this that helped me become a, a better executive because I knew how to speak to the the, the, the executives who were buying songs at the time. Mm. I there was an A and R at the time, um, 
a, a, he was a guy who was A and R and Britney Spears. His name was Steve Lunt, and I was very persistent without being bu a bugaboo. But I was like, "Listen, Steve, I like I said, I know she's the biggest artist in the world, but me and my team here in Atlanta can deliver for this girl. We can we can write songs for her. We can do this. We can do that." And um, I'll never forget the more the moment that I finally got the call and he said, "Okay, cool, um, we're booking your travel. Come to New York and come work with Britney Spears." And which was an amazing opportunity at the time. And it was, you know, this was at the height of Britney. And it was uh, mm -hmm. literally, literally, I spent the next, me and Tricky and our team and Dream Co co-wrote some records with me at the time back then too. It was, uh, we spent the next year, you know, just all things Britney. And wow. we, we were traveling, we traveled the world, everywhere she was doing a Vegas residency, she was all over the world. We were literally making records. But at that point, honestly, I found my way as my own advocate, as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, those people tend to do better. But again, to your initial question for the young songwriter of the game, we will find you. Write great records, yep. collab yep. with great people, put your, always be the, I, I, I always say like, I have some writers that I'm working with now, you know, and you gotta learn. You gotta, you, I, was, I, I, I was in the, I, I remember always being in the room with people that were way better than me. And, that helped me become a great, a, a really good writer. I'll, I'll mm. call myself a great writer. I, I was a great writer at the time. Yeah. You're a great writer. <laughs> and, and so that being said, honestly, like I, I put myself in the room with people that were much better than me. You know, I, I me and Zeke worked with Max Martin. We, we flew to Stockholm and we, we wrote records with Max Martin. I've written records with producer guy named Lane Stewart, who is one of my mentors. I've worked mm -hmm. with a ton, you name it, I probably worked with them. I've been there with Babyface, you know, like, you sure. know, Jimmy and Terry. Flights. I'm like, I put myself in the room with people that had, you know, uh, Guinness Book World Records in terms of hit records. Like, you know, literally, like, yeah. they made me better writers. They made me a better yeah. writer. So I learned to put myself in those rooms. And that, yeah, that's how I became a better writer. But yes, we will find you. Just write great records. Do the work, write great records. I love it. Well, Tab, this has been fantastic. So illuminating. I know all the uh, songwriters, artists, managers, everyone listening to this uh, really appreciates your transparency you. and your wisdom and uh, your generosity and, and everything that you just shared. Sure. Um, I, have, I have one final question that I ask everyone who comes on the show, and that's what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Ooh, from an artist perspective? You can take this however you want. Um, for me to make it, I, it, uh, I'll go back to, to the Alessia Carr story. For me, it was hearing a demo. Um, and I asked the producer, who's the girl singing? And he's like, oh, this is this girl. I'm, I'm just sort of found and she's in Toronto. Um, and I said, well, I, I, you know, disrespect to the song, but I really want to meet this girl. Her tone is great. So for me, um, Going from that meeting, winning the only Best New Artist Grammy in the history of Def Jam, um, for me, that was that was making it for me. <laughs> That's awesome. Right yeah. on. Well, Tab, thank you so much. This is great. Awesome. Thanks for having me, brother. This was really cool. Thanks. Take care. Today's episode was edited by Mikey Evans with music by Brassroots District and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.